Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate the chance to share some of the work that Professor Jack Baker and I, Rodrigo Silva Lopez at Stanford University, we have been doing regarding the application of machine learning and AI techniques for the resilience of broad networks. And in particular today, what I'm gonna share with you is the work that we did in developing a deep learning model to improve and speed the seismic risk assessment of broad networks. Uh, before getting started, I want to invite you to reflect a little bit about like how complex road networks can be. And to illustrate that, let's look at the San Francisco model that we're using for our research and has been used in the uh, research of the Baker Group uh, quite a lot. In this regard, if you think about the Bay Area, the Bay Area comprises almost 1,600 census tracts. On a daily basis, 12 million trips are performed. And when it comes to our model, we represent the broad network through a graph of 11,920 nodes and 32,858 edges. Uh, in that regard, it also includes 1,743 bridges that are managed by Caltrans and that are the vulnerable components to collapse or experience damage to your networks. Beyond the numbers that can be a little bit confusing, the point that I'm trying to make is that when we think about distributed systems and road networks in particular, we're talking about systems that comprise thousands of elements, millions of people, millions of strips, and all of those elements are interacting in highly nonlinear fashion. Hence, when we think about improving the size of risk of this system, or trying to get any significant metric from this system, the analysis tends to be computationally challenging in order to quantify all the intricacies of these systems. In that regard, as an example of what brings us today, uh, when we think about also about the size of risk assessment, it's also a computationally expensive process. Here, I'm showing an example of how this process is performed. And here you can see that in the left figure, given a seismic scenario that is defined by the values of density metric at uh, location of interest, which in this case are bridges, we can use that information to obtain realizations of, of damage for each individual bridge using their priority function, which is the second step of this process. Given the information of damage state for each bridge, we can define whether or not the bridge is functional. Now, despite the network being damaged, commutes still need to be performed. So in that regard, we need to do a traffic assignment process in which we model how all individuals in the network move along the area. So for instance, we will need to know how somebody that is in San Francisco will move to Berkeley or how somebody that's in San Francisco will go to South Bay and so on. And then given that we're trying to help decision makers decide how to improve this system, it's not enough to just characterize how people move. We will actually have to develop metrics that comprise that information in a significant matter. So in order to do so, we use a metric that is a traffic performance metric that aggregates both the lost trips due to impacts to connectivity and also uh, the increase in travel time. Now, as I mentioned, the motivation of this was that it was computationally expensive. Let's look where that cost comes from. So seismic scenario is fast, it's just a rational generation and ground motion model. For the functions that are also fast to compute, it's just a random number and a log normal function. But then we think about traffic assignment, which is modeling how people will move, it's quite expensive computation. In its, most, in its simplest version, it requires to compute the shortest path between all oriented destinations. So for instance, in the previous slide, I showed that the Bay Area had 1,600 census tracts. So if we were to use those points as a real destination, which is some of the information that is available, then that would mean that for running one realization of traffic assignment, we would need to complete the shortest path 2.5 millions of time, which of course is completely expensive. Now, the thing is that it's not only about one seismic scenario, because we're talking about size risk assessment. So for instance, to compute the expected annual transportation loss, you need a suite of seismic scenarios that are has consistent so that represent the seismicity of the range that has been analyzed. To illustrate how many scenarios that can be, for the San Francisco Bay Area, we have 2,000 scenarios. So this process that I already mentioned that is computational expensive to run twice, once, we have to run it 2,000 times. And moreover, that's just to do one assessment. 
you want to evaluate, for instance, what's the impact of retrofit in the Bay Bridge, then we'll need to run the 2000 scenarios against with that bridge and then any other bridge or any combination of, of any number N of bridges. So as you see, the problem grows exponentially uh, and, the pro and the fact that this is really slow doesn't help to actually uh, uh, measure or evaluate our retrofit in actions. So in that regard, with Professor Baker, we started thinking, okay, how can we skip this uh, step of assigning traffic while still providing an, an accurate and rapid surrogate model? And then we observed that using deep neural networks will help us fast track the risk assessment of these systems. And starting by a damage map, the neural network will go directly to a traffic performance metric. Now, given that we decided to use a traffic performance metric with using a neural, sorry, a, a neural network, then the first step we need to do is define the inputs and the outputs that a neural network would actually use. So as I mentioned before, we'll use the damage map uh, but then that damage map will be used by the neural network as a feature spectrum in which each bridge will be defined by a binary variable, which will be zero if the bridge is usable, or one if the bridge is not functional. And then that for all bridges. So you have a vector in the case of our study for one to 1,143 bridges. That will be used by the neural network. And then the output metric will be the traffic performance metric that I defined before. So again, you'll go for a feature, the input would be the features vector and the output would be the traffic performance metric. Uh, okay, and now I already mentioned what's the input and the output, but we actually need to train the, the, the neural network and calibrate it for our purposes. In that regard, uh, the, the, main, the main three factors that we explored to define the architecture of this neural network uh, were three. And th these are summarized here. So the first challenge that we encounter was that when it comes to seismic scenarios, all the seismic scenarios we had were has consistent. So that means that, of course, the probability of, of, of mildly disruptive events was really higher than extreme events. So a question that we had is how using has a consistent sampling, which is the one used by default, would account for these extreme events that, although they're not as likely to happen, they have a huge disruption that we ultimately impacts in the risk analysis. As a second challenge, that is a typical challenge for this kind of calibration, was how to define the hyperparameters of the unit. And in, the, in that regard, you have to develop hyperparameter calibration of number of layers, learning rate, near per layer, activation function, and so on. And finally, the third challenge, we'll, we, we want to conclude that the neural network works. But then, what do we mean with that? So, of course, when you think about these kind of regression models at the neural network, there are statistical validation. But in terms of our purpose, we're civil engineers managing these road networks. So besides the statistical validation, we also want to think about uh, engineering parameters such as expected traffic, annual traffic loss. Uh, for, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the first and the third challenge, which are uh, more important for our community. In that regard, as I mentioned, we want to explore how it has a consistent model performs at predicts true events. So here we were showing a scatter plot of how the neural network on the y-axis predicts compared to the, predict the, the traffic performance predicted by the traffic model on the x-axis. And here in the scatter plot, we'll, it may not be evident that the hazard model uh, actually performs not that well for extreme events. So we actually plotted the difference in terms of the, the error for different windows of traffic performance, trying to see how the error would evolve as a function of how disruptive the event would be. So in this regard, as you see, the orange line shown here, which is has a consistent, induces a bias when we in, uh, increase the disruption of the event. And as a benchmark, we use also random realization of data to train the, the neural network, and the bias induced with that, of course, was uh, less than that. So this raised a problem of, okay, you actually need to modify your hazard consistent by including more extreme events so you actually are, are get better at predicting students. So the second question that was raised was like, okay, how do you actually select that model that trains for more extreme events? So to do so, what we did was we trained several neural networks with different fractions or proportion of extreme events. So here, what we're showing the right plot is in the x-axis is a fraction of data corresponding to extreme events. The blue line is the error, the accuracy on the extreme events, and the gray 
line is the is uh, corresponds to all events in test data. So here, of course, you can see that if you don't have a lot of extreme events, then the performance for extreme events will be really low. But then as you increase the number of extreme events, then it increases. The thing is that here, you can see the sweet area in which both all events and also extreme events uh, have an accuracy that is high. So when it comes to selecting the best model, we decided to use a model that had an oversample of those extreme events up to 80%. And with that 80%, you make sure that both extreme events are properly quantified and also the, all, all the rest of the events. Now, okay, we have defined three different sampling models, but then I started this presentation saying that it was hard to actually perform realizations of seismic uh, uh, risk. So, but now I'm telling you that you should train your network. The problem is that to train your network, you actually need data. So you need to run, run the seismic realizations uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a lot. So we try to answer like, what do we mean by quite a lot? Here, what we realized was that we train in the, here we're showing actually dependency and the accuracy at the number of realization and training data. And we observed that if you use just a thousand realizations for the extreme events and hazard system, the R square value of the model is already over 0 0.75. And then, for 10,000, oh, it's already almost reached the plateau. And this is actually very powerful because if you remember from my slide of the science risk assessment, the number of scenarios that we have for our test bed was 2,000 realizations. So using half of those realizations that are one analysis only, you already get 0 0.75 for the neural network. But then if you run it five times, which I do uh, during my PhD on a daily basis, you, just ha you already have enough data to calibrate a neural network that for, for which you would not need to run any other model any, uh, again. And this is really powerful because instead of having to run the scientific model all the time, you can use this neural network as an alternate to improve your speed. In terms of validation, the third challenge that I mentioned that we we're gonna to tackle today, uh, besides the statistical performance that we show you that the R-score value was over 0 0.95. We also thought about some metrics that are used by decision, making, decision makers to evaluate whether or not some retrofitting actions are, are actually useful or not. And that we got, we defined the use of two metrics. We, def we defined the use of loss curves and also the use of expected annual loss. Uh, in that regard here, I'm showing two sets of curves one set of curves, the orange one, represents the performance of the, of the, of the, of the model without retrofitting. The blue line is for 500 random bridges selected to retrofit. And then in a continuous line, you can say, you see the result of the traffic model, and in the dashed line, the result of the near network. As you can see, if you account for the certainty in actually these realizations, both set of curves, the traffic model versus the near network, are the same. But actually, they're not the same in a really good fashion, in a good, really good way. And it's time-wise. The traffic model, which I run in my personal computer, which is a MacBook Pro of late 2016, would take eight hours to compute. So this means that this plot that I'm showing took 16 hours to run in my own computer. But then if you think about the neural network, it took 0 0.3 seconds to develop the same curves that I'm showing here, which is almost 100,000 times faster. Again, this is really powerful because, and again, throughout my PhD, I've been trying to develop different retrofitting strategies. And what I have been doing so far is running traffic model all the time, getting up to 20 or 30 evaluations in the cloud. Hey, but with your neural networks, I can run this couple of, 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 uh, of, of, of curves in a couple of seconds in my own uh, desktop computer. We got uh, about two minutes left. And when it comes to the second metric that we mentioned, we also thought about the expected transportation annual loss. And here, what, I, what I'm showing, which is basically the area under the curve of the, diff of, of the previous slide. And we observed that in the y-axis is a result of the, of the area computed by using the neural network model and then the traffic model. And you can conclude that it's basically aligned with the identity line, which is optimal, which means that the results that we get for that metric, either using the and uh, the neural network, all the traffic model are the same. So when it comes to next steps, 
uh, given that we train this neural network that has as input the status of the bridges, we want to use variable importance algorithm to detect what, bridge, what bridges are clear, critical to predict traffic performance metric. And secondly, using that variables import algorithm, we want to explore how to propose a retrofitting strategy that minimizes traffic disruption risk. So as conclusion of my presentation today, what you want you to have as takeaways are the first neural networks are accurately and, and rapid at predicting traffic disruption in a large and complex transportation model, given the dynamic state of all bridges. Uh, when, and the second takeout that I want you to understand is that when training the model, we need to oversample extreme events so we can account for these events properly. Otherwise, the neural network will focus on fitting a small and frequent, sorry, a small, uh, frequent eye, a small disruption event that are of lesser interest for risk management. And finally, even though you're training for extreme events, the performance for non-extreme events is also quite good. And more importantly, the spectrum of experiments that this opens, given that it's so fast compared to the previous uh, model, it's really yeah, incredible. And in that regard, the benefits of exploring bridge water fittings will motivate the several different studies. And with that, I conclude my presentation. If you have any other questions, of course, uh, at the end of this set, uh, of these presentations, we'll open questions. But uh, if you if you cannot ask me questions there, also I'll leave my email. If you have